Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. Great to see you this morning. Great to be with you. Hey, we start a new sermon series today called Belong. And just straight out of the gates, I want to invite you to think about a time in your life when you felt like you really belonged. I want you to Get that image in your mind. Maybe it was in elementary school, a group of friends on the playground. Uh, Maybe it was a family reunion with a family that was really close and you felt like you belonged. Maybe it was at work and a group of people did a work project together, but you felt like you really belonged. Uh, Would you get in your mind this image and, and really this feeling of belonging at some point that you felt along uh, your journey? As I think about that for myself, the first thing that pops in my mind was a group that I was a part of in college, specifically a small group. Uh, a guy by the name of Ray Anderson had invited eight college guys to uh, be a part of a small group in his home. And every Monday at 4 p.m., we'd go over to his house, and he had really young kids. They would crawl all over us, and they'd want to wrestle. His wife made chocolate chip cookies for us. Uh, and then we'd settle down in his den, and, he, and, and Ray would say, hey, let's just go around the circle. What's the best thing that happened to you all week long? What's the worst thing that happened to you all week long? And we'd share, and there was a group of, of eight other guys that actually cared about the best and the worst going on in my life. Then we'd crack open our Bibles, and we'd study. We, and the first book of the Bible I ever studied from, from beginning to end was the book of Nehemiah in Ray Anderson's den. And then at the end of our time, Ray would say, hey, how can we be praying for you this week? And we'd share what our prayer needs were. And then he'd say, okay, I want you to pray for the guy on your right. And I'm just standing up before you tell you, I felt like I belonged when I was a part uh, of that group. It was a group of guys that cared about the best and the worst going on in my life, a group of guys who were praying for me, and a group of guys who were growing spiritually uh, with me. I belonged. Several years ago, uh, Susie Becker came out with a book called The All Better Book, (laughs) in which she published the answers of elementary school-aged children to some of our biggest problems that we have in in the world. She would pose certain problems to these elementary-aged kids, like war and world peace and the economy, and then she'd ask them, what answer would you suggest for that? And so one of the questions she posed to these elementary age children was this. She said, with billions of people in the world, someone should be able to figure out a system where no one is lonely. What would you suggest? Kalina, age eight, gave this answer. She said, find all the lonely people and get their phone number. Then find all the people who are not lonely and get their phone number. When you have an even number of people, then assign lonely and not lonely people to each other. (laughs) I think she had the gift of administration. (laughs) With billions of people in the world, someone should be able to figure out a system where no one is lonely. What do you suggest? Max, age nine, gave this answer. (laughs) We need to invent some food that talks to you when you eat. For instance, the food could say, how are you doing? What happened to you today? With billions of people in the world, somebody should figure out a system where people aren't lonely. What do you suggest? Matt, age eight, gave this answer. We could get people a pet or a husband or a wife and take them places. This makes you wonder about Matt's understanding of marriage. (laughs) With billions of people in the world, somebody should figure out a system where people aren't lonely. What do you suggest? Brian, age eight, gave this answer. Sing a song, stomp your feet, read a book. Sometimes I think no one loves me, so that's what I do. Hmm. With billions of people in the world, somebody should figure out a system where no one is lonely. This morning, I want to propose to you that someone has. His name is God, and his answer to loneliness is recorded in the Bible. And I want to invite us to spend the next seven Sundays studying what God has to say uh, in answer uh, to this. So if you look on page three of your worship guide, you'll find some sermon notes there. You can also find those sermon notes digitally on our app. And then if you've got a Bible, turn with me in your Bible to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter one. Uh, We're going to look at the very first verses 
of the whole Bible. I want to encourage you to bring a Bible with you each of these Sundays together because every Sunday I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say, turn with me in your Bible too, and we're going to look at a Bible passage together. If you'll bring your Bible to church, uh, I'll, I'll teach you your Bible. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, it would be our honor and privilege to give you one for free. And out here in the lobby at the welcome desk is just a stack of ESV, English Standard Version Bibles, and we'd love to give you one of those. ESV is what I read from uh, up here. So let's say a prayer, and then we're going to dive into what the Bible has to say uh, about belonging. Let's pray. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we dedicate these seven Sundays uh, to you and to uh, belonging to you and belonging to each other and to people. Um, would you speak to us from your word, period, and would you speak to us about belonging? Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so look in those sermon notes on page three of the worship guide, and let me walk you through the purpose, the problem, the solution, and the hope of belonging. So point number one there in your notes is this. We were made to belong. So the first fill in the blank there in your notes is the word made. We were made to belong. Uh, you were made by God, and God exists in relationship. There's just one God, but God exists in an eternal relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let me show you this in the first pages of the Bible. So Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to show you God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the first three verses. Check it out. Verse 1. In the beginning, God, that's God the Father, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, there's God the Spirit right there, was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, that's God the Son, who John chapter 1 tells us is the Word. The Word of God, God said, is the Son of God. Now flip over to verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This is fascinating. Then God said, let us make man in our image. God is an us. <laughs> when God wanted to paint a picture of himself, himself, he created a relationship. He created a family. He created a man. He created a woman. And eventually he created a child. We exist to be in relationship. Look again at verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man. And the word there for man is the word for humankind in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, humans, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God exists in relationship, and God created us in his image, in his likeness, which means you and I were created for a relationship. God does not want you to be alone. We were made to belong. The Bible says this, and science says this. The United States Surgeon General says that widespread loneliness poses health risks just as significant as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. And a Harvard study concluded that people who have bad health habits, such as smoking, eating bad, obesity, poor sleep habits, no exercise, people who have bad health habits but who have strong social ties live significantly longer than people who have great health habits but are isolated. In other words, it's better to eat Twinkies with your friends than to eat broccoli alone. You were made to belong. Look at the way Rick Warren says this. I put this in your notes. He says, you were formed for God's family. God wants a family, and he created you to be a part of it. This is one of God's purposes for your life, which he planned before you were born. The entire Bible is the story of God building a family who will love him, honor him, and reign with him. Listen, we were made to belong. But something has gotten in the way of us belonging, namely sin, which is the next fill in the blank there in your notes. Sin has destroyed our belonging to God and our belonging to each other. Sin has destroyed our belonging to God and our belonging to each other. 
I'll let you go home and read Genesis 3 on your own. Here's the recap. In Genesis 3, humans sinned against God, thus breaking fellowship with God and breaking fellowship with each other. Just one chapter later in Genesis 4, we see the first murder when Cain kills his brother Abel. Do you see it? Sin has destroyed our relationship with God and it's destroyed our relationship with each other. Now we see that all over the Bible. Look at these other verses I put here in your notes. Romans chapter three, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter six, the wages of sin is death, separation from God, separation from each other. Isaiah 53, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And Romans five, therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sin. We were made to belong. The bad news is, is that sin has destroyed our belonging to God and our belonging to each other. That's the bad news. The good news is that God has a plan for restoring belonging. God has a plan for restoring belonging. And the heart of God's plan is Jesus. So the next fill in the blank there in your notes is Jesus. God's, the heart of God's plan for restoring belonging is Jesus. Look at the scriptures that I put here in your notes. Romans 5. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then look at this next scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 in your notes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ, here it is, reconciled us to himself. He's restoring belonging from you to God and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now, some of you are sitting there in your seat and you're you're thinking, Jim, you're just sharing the gospel here. You bet I'm sharing the gospel here. But the gospel is the heart of belonging. We just tend to think of the gospel in terms of saving us from immoral sins, which it does. But the gospel also saves us from our relational sins. The gospel is for our relationships. Jesus came and died on the cross for us so that we might belong to God again and belong to each other again. With billions of people in the world, somebody should think up a system where people aren't lonely. God has. The fancy word for this is reconciliation. Look again at the 2 Corinthians 5 scripture we just read, but read it with fresh eyes in terms of reconciliation. This is the solution. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ, here it is, reconciled us to himself and then turned around and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and then entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. The gospel is a reconciling gospel. The gospel restores belonging. With billions of people in the world, somebody should think up a system to keep people from being lonely. God has. He has reconciled us through Jesus Christ. So the heart of God's plan to restore you and me to belonging is Jesus. His life, his death, and his resurrection. And then the principles for God's plan for restoring belonging are found in God's word. So the next fill in the blank there is God's word. The principles of God's plan for restoring our belonging are found in God's word. So this book right here is our belonging guide. Look at the scriptures uh, and what they say about this. Second Peter chapter one, we looked at this one last week. And because of his glory and excellence, God has given us, here it is, great and precious promises, his word, the Bible. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature, that's belonging, and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. 
in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to correct us when we're wrong, including in our relationships, and to teach us to do what is right, including in our relationships. God uses it, his word, to prepare and equip his people to do every good work, including belonging. So what we're going to do together over the coming six weeks is we're going to look in this book together at the principles that God has set up for us for belonging. Let me just give you a flyover of those principles right now, and then we'll do a deep dive in each one over the coming six Sundays together. But I want to encourage you to not wait for the future Sundays. You're going to hear the principles right now. And would you just pick, with God's help and leading, pick one or two of these to apply to your life this week. What are one or two of these that you need most in your relationships right now? Here we go. Six belonging principles from God's word. Principle number one. Belonging happens best when we are known and loved. We're going to talk about that next week. Principle number two, belonging happens when we do life together. We're going to talk about that on September the 1st. Principle number three, belonging requires that we risk authenticity, vulnerability, honesty, and candor. Talk about that on September the 8th. Principle four, belonging requires resolving conflict. Ouch, this is a big one. It's a hard one. It's an important one. We'll talk about it on September the 15th. Principle number five are belonging principles for marriage. September 22nd, and on September 29th, we'll get belonging principles for family. Just a few minutes, I want to invite you to come up to this prayer altar and kneel and bring these sermon notes with you and ask God to help you and empower you to live one or two of these principles this week in your relationships. I know a group of people in Poland who ask God for help with that. Uh, as you'll remember, uh, Germany did some awful things to the people of Poland during World War II. Uh, if you've ever read the book or seen the movie The Zookeeper's Wife, you get just a tiny taste of how horrendous Germany's treatment of Poland was, destroying entire cities, incinerating and slaughtering thousands and thousands of Polish people. It was awful. Ten years after that, 10 years after World War II, two peacemakers visited a group of Polish Christians and asked them this question. Would you be willing to meet with other Christians from West Germany? They want to ask for your forgiveness for what Germany did to Poland during World War II, and they want to build a relationship with you. At first, there was silence among these Polish men and women in this room and then one Polish man spoke up and he said, what you are asking is impossible. Every stone in Warsaw is soaked in Polish blood by these Germans. We cannot forgive. Later, during that same meeting, before the group dismissed, they all said the Lord's Prayer together aloud and when they reached the words forgive us our sins as we forgive all of a sudden everybody in the room stopped the prayer and there was a tension in the air and after a long pause that Polish man who had spoken so vehemently before said I must say yes to you. I could no more pray the Lord's Prayer. I could no more call myself a Christian if I refuse to forgive. Humanly speaking, I cannot forgive. But God will give us the strength to forgive. And 18 months later, the Polish and West German Christians met together in Vienna, establishing friendships that continue to this day. It's amazing. And it also leads to the next point there in your notes, 
which is the power for God's plan is God's spirit. So the next fill in the blank there is God's spirit. The power for God's plan of belonging is God's spirit. The heart of God's plan for belonging is Jesus. The principles for God's plan for belonging are found in his word. And the power for God's plan for belonging is God's spirit. Look at the scriptures that I put there in your notes. Titus chapter 3. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy and we hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life. Here it is. Through the Holy Spirit. That's where the power comes from. Through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then in Acts chapter 1, Jesus said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The power to reconcile relationships and to live the belonging principles comes from God's Spirit living inside of you if you've ever invited him in and if you've surrendered the driver's seat of your life to his control. You see, when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, he sends his spirit, also called the Holy Spirit, to live inside you. And then day by day, actually hour by hour, actually moment by moment, you and I must choose whether to surrender the driver's seat of our life to the spirit's control. But when we do, the spirit gives us power to love people. And the spirit gives us power to forgive people. And the Spirit gives us power to listen to each other. And the Spirit gives us power to serve people. The Spirit gives us power to belong and the power to help other people belong. You shall receive power to belong as the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you allow him to direct and control and empower your life. All right, one last sub point here. The heart of God's plan for belonging is Jesus. The principles for God's plan for belonging are found in his word. The power for God's plan for belonging is his spirit. And then last point, the hope of God's plan for belonging is heaven. So heaven is the last fill in the blank there in your notes. The hope of God's plan for belonging is heaven. Listen to the Apostle John describe heaven in Revelation 21. I put this in your notes. He says, in heaven, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And God says, I am making all things new. Bible scholar Randy Alcorn says, he says, in heaven... We will experience all the best of human relationships with none of the worst. The burdens and tragedies of life will be lifted from us. We'll be free of what displeases God and free of what damages relationships. Listen, all of our human relationships here on earth fall short. They can be good. They can even be great as we live the belonging principles of the Bible. But all of our relationships here on earth fall short. But in heaven, in heaven, all of our relationships will be perfect. And we will experience perfect belonging. We get a few glimpses of this from Scripture. And we get a few glimpses of this from people who have had what are called near-death experiences. They die, experience a little bit of heaven, and then come back to earth and tell us about it. Listen to Don Piper's story. Don was coming back from a pastor's conference when an 18-wheeler lost control on a rainy bridge and hit Don head-on, running over the top of his car. 
When EMS arrived several minutes later, Don was pronounced dead. For 90 minutes, his dead body lay trapped in the car while EMS waited in, for the jaws of life to cut him out of the squashed wreckage. Here's what Don shares. He says, simultaneous with my last recollection of seeing the bridge in the rain, a light enveloped me with a brilliance beyond earthly comprehension or description. In my next moments of awareness, I was standing in heaven. Joy pulsated through me as I looked around, and at that moment, I became aware of a large crowd of people. They stood in front of a brilliant, ornate gate. I have no idea how far away they were. Such things as distance don't matter in heaven. As the crowd rushed towards me, I saw people I had known, and I knew instantly that all of them had died during my lifetime. Their presence seemed absolutely natural. They rushed toward me, and every person was smiling, shouting, and praising God. Although no one said so, intuitively, I knew they were my celestial welcoming committee. It was as if they had all gathered just outside of heaven's gate waiting for me. The first person I recognized was Joe Colberth, my grandfather. He looked exactly as I had remembered him. With his shock of white hair and what I called a big banana nose, he stopped momentarily and stood in front of me. A grin covered his face. Donnie, that's what my grandfather called me. His eyes lit up and he held out his arms as he took the last steps toward me. He embraced me, holding me tightly. He was once again the robust, strong grandfather I had remembered as a child. The crowd surrounded me. Some hugged me, a few kissed me on my cheek, while others pumped my hand. Never had I felt more loved. One person in that greeting committee was Mike Wood, my childhood friend. Mike was special because he invited me to Sunday school and was influential in my becoming a Christian. Mike was the most devoted young Christian I knew. He was also a popular kid and had lettered four years in football, basketball, and track. When he was 19, Mike was killed in a car wreck. It broke my heart when I heard about his death. Now I saw Mike in heaven. As he slipped his arm around my shoulder, my pain and grief vanished. Never had I seen Mike smile so brightly. I still didn't know why, but the joyousness of the place wiped away all questions that I had had. Everything felt blissful, perfect. More and more people reached for me and called me by name. I felt overwhelmed by the number of people who had come to welcome me to heaven. I saw Barry Wilson, who had been my classmate in high school, but had later drowned in a lake. Barry hugged me, and his smile radiated a happiness I didn't know was possible. He and everyone that followed praised God and told me how excited they were to see me and to welcome me to heaven and to the fellowship that they enjoyed. Just then I spotted two teachers who had loved me and often talked to me about Jesus Christ. As I walked among all these people, I became aware that each one of these people had influenced my life in some way on earth. And even though they had never met each other on earth, they seem to know each other now. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is but a glimpse of the kind of belonging we will experience in heaven. And I'm so glad that God allowed Don to come back to life and come back to earth so he could share these glimpses with us. All right, time to land the plane. Look at this section of your notes entitled, My Application of Belonging Today. How are you going to respond to what you've heard from God's word today? I've listed seven possible applications. What are one or two of these for you today? Maybe you would say, my application is to believe and receive Jesus Christ. I choose to begin my journey of belonging to God and others by receiving Jesus Christ. And then you could just pray this prayer right here and say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead. Jesus, I receive you into my life. 
Now please make me into the person that you want me to be. Would you make that your prayer today? And then the Bible says the next step to take after that, whether you've prayed a prayer like that today or 10 years ago, the next step to take is then to go public with that decision through public water baptism. And so uh, we're going to have our next immersion baptism service in a few weeks from now on September the 8th. After second service, I'll put information about that there in your notes. Watch this video from our last baptism back in June. What I love about this video is it has baptisms both from this campus and it has baptisms from our North Katy campus as well. Watch this. I wanted to make sure that my faith is public. I would just like to make a public announcement and I'm ready to just go public. I'm telling you, if you've been like feeling like you want to get baptized, I say just step into it and do it. It's so worth it, and it's really going to be the next step in your faith journey. I know it's a hard choice because there's just so many what ifs, but that's really just the enemy talking and that's just overthinking. And I struggle with overthinking myself, but really the best thing you can do is just give it to God every time. I'm excited to get baptized because God loves me. So good, so good. Maybe that's your application today. Maybe your application today is to uh, commit to come the next six Sundays in order to learn and grow in the Bible's principles of belonging. I'm committing to attend the next six Sundays or to join online if I have to be out of town. Maybe your application today is applying some of the biblical belonging principles now. And so I just recap some of those Pick one or two. In the power of God's spirit, I'm going to, what are you going to do? I'm going to know and love others. I'm going to be known and receive love from others. I'm going to spend quality and quantity time with others. I'm going to take a spirit-directed risk of authenticity, vulnerability, honesty, and candor. I'm going to ask forgiveness of someone whom I have hurt. I'm going to forgive someone who has hurt me, like our Polish friends forgave our German friends. I'm going to take a step of growth, closeness, partnership, connection, and intimacy in my marriage. I'm going to take a step of prioritizing and loving my family. Would you come to the prayer altar in just a minute and kneel and ask God for the power to live one of these principles? Maybe your application today is to surrender control to God's spirit. Say, I cannot live the belonging principles of my own power. So, Spirit of Jesus Christ, I ask you to sit in the driver's seat of my life and to direct, control, and empower my life and my relationships. Come to the prayer altar and pray that prayer. Maybe your application today is to say yes to belong. So we're going to call next Sunday, Say Yes Sunday. And you can say, I'm going to take my next step to belonging in the spiritual family of my church by plugging into a group of some kind or plugging into serving of some kind or both. And so I'm going to show up next Sunday to say yes to belong on the porch and lobby. So next Sunday after each service, we're going to have the lobby and the porch set up with just booths all over the place so you can investigate different ways to plug into a group in the church or to plug into serving in the church. Um, you actually don't have to wait till next Sunday. If you go to the Say Yes tab on our website, you can begin to explore that even now. Or you'd say, I'm going to consider joining this church family. Grace Fellowship offers two lunch classes that we call Connecting at Grace. 
to help explore the possibility of making this your church home. And I put some information about that uh, there in your notes. I just want to close with Sarah's uh, story, a remarkable story about a woman from Asia named Sarah. Uh, Sarah grew up in an atheist country and did not believe in God or Jesus. Sarah does not live in West Houston or Katy, Texas. Sarah lives 7,200 miles away in Asia. Last year, Sarah was going through a difficult time, and her friend Audrey spent time listening to her and empathizing with her and praying with her and ministering to her online. Audrey shared the message of Jesus with Sarah and invited her to read the Bible with her. And then Audrey invited Sarah to attend Grace Fellowship's Alpha course online. Sarah attended Alpha online last year, and she and Audrey would chat online regularly about Alpha and about the one-year Bible readings that they were doing at the same time. Sarah decided to repent of her sins and to invite Jesus Christ into her life. And then, because of the belonging relationship she developed online, joining Grace Fellowshippers online, Sarah decided to fly all the way from Asia to Katy, Texas to get baptized today (laughs) after second service. She's going public with her faith in Christ. Sarah's flown all the way from Asia to Katy to get baptized. Why? Because she feels like she belongs here. That's the power of belonging. That's the power of belonging in a family of Jesus Christ. How far would you travel to belong? (laughs) I invite you to travel 15 yards up to this prayer altar and kneel and talk to God about belonging. Come and kneel and pray about whatever God's been talking to you about this morning. And we would love to pray with you at the prayer altar. If you cup your hands, that's the symbol that says, I'd like somebody to pray with me and one of us will pray with you. You are welcome in this place. You belong in this place. Sarah was willing to travel 7,200 miles to express her belonging. You travel 15 yards and express yours. With billions of people in the world, Somebody should think up a system so that people aren't lonely. God has. Peralta's open. I'm going to be down here praying. I invite you to join me.